Romans 15. And I want to talk about what we are asked to do with what we have and the strength and the unity that we should have because of it. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we begin here. Father, I thank you so much for those that are able to gather here today. Lord, I thank you that we have power in one place to, to gather and, and praise you and worship you and, and raise you up in song, Lord. And also, I just pray that you give me the words that you want spoken for this message as we go into this, this time, Lord. And I pray also, Lord, that you just open our hearts, soften us so that we can hear it, hear this and plant the seed that you want to plant. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to talk about strengths a little bit. When, as I'm going through these things and I'm, I'm reading different stuff, I, thought, I was thinking of a country song. And sometimes they come up, and I don't know, I don't listen to a lot of country music, but there was one called Tattoos and Scars. And it's the story talks about a young guy coming into a bar and sitting there to this old guy and saying, hey, you want to see my tattoos? And the old guy, and the whole thing is about tattoos and scars being different things. Because the old guy's got scars from World War II and stuff like that. So yeah, you can pay for a tattoo, but a scar is a different thing. And the scars that we might have earned in our life, which I, usually you earn a scar, and you did something wrong, you did something, <clears throat> you made a mistake, or and my hands are covered with scars from all sorts of poor decisions in my life. From third grade on, I've got some pretty good scarring on my hands and some other places. I've got knife scars, I've got all sorts of things. And all of those taught me a lesson. Every time I got a scar, I changed my behavior. There was something to change after that. Whether it was stitches I got or whatever, doesn't matter. You do something like that, you don't do it again. When I was in third grade, I caught the back of my hand. I had, everybody's seen those little leather gloves that's got the red ball on there and you tighten them down on the wrist. Don't know why those were cool, but they were cool. And I was in third grade and we had an old grinder mixer going and we were mixing feed. And at some point in time, we lost the guard that went around the uh, auger, is it? The outlet auger. And it was my job, we were doing that, to hold this thing up there. And when I did, that little red ball got caught in two gears and pulled my hand in. And it was chipping bones and all sorts of things. Um, two things I learned there. Number one, Dad helped me up to the house when we ran into the hospital. And when I, on the way to the house, Dad lost his pant leg because my border collie thought he was causing all the screaming and pain and blood, so it shoot the pants right off of him. And the other thing I, I learned is that it's easy to put a guard back on because the guard was right back on after that. We put those things on immediately just because it was easier to leave them off initially, but realizing what it was going to cost to leave it off. Those scars strengthen us. Those things teach us lessons. We learn from that. So let's go into Romans 15. And we'll talk about strength. <laughs> you say it with cut speed. It is, or some things. Okay, Romans 15, 1 through 5. This is going to be our focal verse today. I just want to read it through in its entirety to start with. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you, you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. <clears throat> May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. This passage talks about strength in the beginning, those who are strong, and then what, what we do with it. And that is what I really want to focus on today, is within our strength, I see, the, I see faithful people gathered here. I see faithful people that are constantly working and getting themselves stronger, getting better at things. I, I always equate spiritual strength to physical strength in my mind. Because we work, at, uh, work with the powerlifting team and the football team and those kind of things. We work towards physical strength with the understanding that if you back off for a while you're going to lose some of it i heard my back about three weeks ago i took three weeks off without without doing any serious lifting i'm going to start back in next week hoping it's better but i know that monday i will not be as strong as i was the day before i hurt my back i've lost some of it because i kind of laid off for a while 
it, it goes, it fades. You have to keep at it to keep it up there. And I think our spiritual life is the same way. But those of us gathered here today that are walking with the Lord have some strength that other people don't have. Whether that's from constant effort, like we should have, or whether that's, like I said, from the scars. Sometimes we learn lessons. As parents, do we not try and give advice so that our kids don't make the mistakes we did? If you listen, you won't do what we did. And trust me, I'm saying these things because I know better because maybe I got burned by it, so I won't. I don't want it to be passed on. But when we talk about the strength and who we are, we to talk about that first. We'll, we'll go verse by verse through this. Romans 15, 1. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Go ahead, Peter. 1 Peter 1 says, our strength is in hope. Therefore, with minds that are full, alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And this concept, this concept of our strength and our being our hope is something that it, it dawned on me is that's really what our strength is. If someone sees us going through something that's difficult, and yet we hold on to our faith, that's because we have hope. If someone sees us weathering a storm, the understanding is the reason we do it is because we have hope. We're not better than anyone else. We're not, we're not uh, to be set apart because of or you're a better person, or, or you have more character, or anything like that. It's just simply the fact that we have hope. Uh, my grandmother's funeral last this week, um, I went in, and my whole family was there, and there's a lot of us. It's a big crew. We were the only ones in the church. Grandma was 92 years old and kind of outlived all her friends. And she'd been living in Des Moines and wanted to be buried in Waverly, so she came back to Waverly for that. And it, took us, it was kind of funny. It's a beautiful, big old Catholic church. Big church, not old, it's new. And they got it set up so acoustically it's beautiful. It's kind of rounded shape and all the pews kind of go like this. But God bless them, the, the gentleman at the, from the funeral service came in and guided everybody into a seat. So that put like the 40 of us in the family over here in one section and the other five people that showed up over here. It's really lopsided. Kind of like, kind of like we are today. Uh, but... One thing I noticed when we came in and the family got gathered together and we all got together, there was pictures up and, and stories were being told and stuff like that, but there were no tears shed because we knew where Grandma was. We knew that she had a strong faith and that through her faith and her hope, we knew where she was. So later on during the service, there was, there was a little bit of tears shed here and there, but it was mainly for ourselves. It was in ourselves that we were going to miss her, not because she was gone, because we know where she went. We know that there was a reunion in heaven with my grandfather and all the other things. She was widowed for 24 years. And she said, um, one of my cousins who was there told me that when she was visiting her in that last week, she said, I just can't wait. I can't wait to tell him everything that's going on down here. She just... She had her bed in her room turned so that she could face her wedding picture on the wall for the last two weeks when she was pretty much stuck in her bed. That kind of hope is something that I grab a hold of, and that's that's the kind of strength that we should have when this when we talk about these passages. With your minds alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought. That's where our strength comes from. It's from that hope. If somebody asks you why are you doing so well when everybody else did so poorly at something. Why, did, why? I can't believe you have a smile on your face. You know what? It's because I have hope. And that's something that we can share. See? So what do we do with this? What are we meant to do with this strength? We are meant to be strong in the Lord. It's not my strength. It's his strength. But because of the relationship we can have with Jesus, we can get his strength. That's what holds us up. We can't hold ourselves up. If you ever see somebody who tries to stand on their, on their own with their own strength, they will fall. It never fails because we're human and we have that weakness in us. It's, we're going to fail. But if we lean on Jesus, he doesn't fail. So he'll always hold us up. Continuing on in Romans 15, 1, we ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. 
Bear with the failings of the weak. Well, what does that mean? Well, bearing with the failings of the weak simply means to use our strength. Sometimes we are the hands and feet of God. God, uh, Jesus calls us to do that. We are to be his hands and feet. He is the, we are the body. He is the, the head. As the hands and feet of God, we should be taking that weight too. If someone's got a burden, our first response should be, how can I help? And whether that's a spiritual burden, whether that's a physical burden, whether that's something emotional that they're going through, whether it's, it's addiction, whether it's, it's suffering of any kind, we should say, what can I do to help? And take that burden and, and pick that up for somebody. And that's not just somebody in the church, although this, this passage is often, we get into Romans 15 here, it's often talking about the church, and it talks about unity there. But I think Jesus intended it everywhere. Jesus' intention was for us to be helping each other out. He passed it on to 12, and those 12 passed it on to the rest of us. He shared it with Paul, and Paul shared it with the rest of us. Nobody got it, put it in a bucket, and kept it for themselves. You want to see an example of that? That's what Jesus ran into when he was on the earth. He got to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were keeping it to themselves. They thought they had all the knowledge that they ever needed. They had all the religious knowledge in the world, but they didn't have a heart. The heart wasn't engaged. And Jesus said, don't be like them. The yeast of the Pharisees, don't be like them. Get your heart engaged. Be involved. That's where your strength is going to come from. Romans 15, or excuse me, Galatians 6, 1, 1 and 2 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, and you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. Now, in this specific passage here, coming out of Galatians, Paul is talking about going to another believer who's having problems and gently bring them back. If you know somebody's struggling with something, don't have a confrontation where you stand over them and shake your finger, but go and sit down next to them, put your arm around them and say, I know you're having a hard time. I see that. But I'm here for you. God's here for you. Let's see. Let's figure out what it takes to bring them back. If you walk away from someone who's walking away, they may never come back. Now Jesus himself spent most of his time with the lower end of people. He didn't go to the top of the mountain. He went down to the base first. And that's where he worked. And that's because he could empathize with us because he was here walking on earth and he had enough compassion that he shared it. And that's what he's asking us to do. When it says you will fulfill the law of Christ, what is the law of Christ? Well, you remember he was asked, what's, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your might and love your neighbor as yourself. That was his command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if we are loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, then we should be carrying that burden. It should be almost automatic for us, shouldn't it? If we look at that, should that not be something that that is our first response? I think about that sometimes when... when uh, I think about responses when someone says, well, there's nothing left to do but pray. We've all heard that. It's kind of sad that that's not our first response, but when, it, when everything else runs out, then we say there's nothing left but to pray. Our first response should be going into prayer. But in dealing with someone else's problems, our first response should be the same way. Go into them with, in, a, in a mindful thing, and those of us who live by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, should be able to find the need. And if you find the need, the Spirit will lead you to find a solution for that need. Our strength isn't in ourselves, but our strength is there as long as we ask for it, as long as we lean on it. Don't expect yourself to be able to solve all the world's problems. That's not going to happen. But God can solve it. So when it's time for us to deal with something, that's where we need to deal with it. Here. Now Romans 15 2 said each of us should please our neighbor for their good to build them up. We're not doing these things 
Jesus didn't do these things so that he could receive praise. I was reading uh, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. We all know that story where Jesus takes the little boy's five loaves and two fishes and, and feeds everybody and he preaches and all those wonderful things are happening. And then after that, we know after that it's when he walked on water, all those things. In between, there's a little passage when you're in John where he says, he went away by himself because he knew they would forcibly try and make him king. Nothing that he did, he did for accolades. He did because it was what was right. It was what was right to be done. So we should build people up for their good, not for ours. That's not the purpose. Philippians 2, 4 and 5 says, Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. To have the same mindset as Christ. That should be our relationship mindset. When we're dealing with someone else, any of our relationships should be based on Christ. Whether it's a marital relationship, whether it's a, it's a sibling relationship, whether it's a relationship with children, neighbors, it doesn't matter. Our mindset should be the mindset of Christ. So when we see that person that's struggling and suffering, our mindset should be the mindset of Christ. There was a TV show on Netflix that we watched sometime called Brain Games. And they were doing a, an experiment. And the first, first thing they did is they put a wallet on the ground. They had cameras watching to see how long it took somebody to notice the wallet. Boom. Everybody was right on that wallet. Then the next time they put the wallet down, they took a can of red spray paint and put a circle on it. Everybody walked around and just left it there. We're so conditioned to behave ourselves. So, so somebody mark that, we'll walk away. And then the next experiment they did is they had someone fall in a crowd in an open area in the city. And they started with an elderly person fell down, and everybody gathered around and tried to pick them up. It was a big, everybody, right away, people were there. And they had someone a little younger fall down. Everybody came over and picked them up. But then they had someone fall down that had a bottle in their hand. And when they fell down, they were asking for help. Can somebody please help me? And everybody walked around, very lonely. And they talked on this, this isn't a Christian show, but they talked about how people's preconceptions of what the cause is limits their compassion. We see someone who might be in a situation that was probably started by themselves. If an elderly person falls down, it's not their fault that they're old. Everybody would say that. But if someone's been drinking and they fall down, they instigated the circumstances that caused them to fall. So I ask you, would Jesus differentiate between the two? I don't think so. When he was asked, why are you, why are you dining with sinners? He said, that's because that's who I came with. With the tax collectors, with the partiers, with that kind of stuff. That's who I came for. The ones who need me the most are the ones who should get first attention, shouldn't they? And when we see someone that's suffering in that way, even if it is self-induced suffering, our response should be the response of Jesus. Help them up physically, but also help them spiritually. You will not be able to deal with what caused the circumstance until you deal with the circumstances. If someone's starving, feed them. And then talk about Jesus. Because that's what he did. If someone is sick, he healed them. Then they got the gospel. When someone came to him, when the Pharisees came to him and said, Who sinned, this man or his father? And Jesus said, Nobody sinned. This man is lame because of a time like this. It was meant he was meant to be lifted up. When he saw someone hurting, when he saw someone that had an issue, he dealt with the issue first. He helped them deal with that issue, and through that, they understood the love of God. So if we're his hands and feet, we should be lifting people up, not for our own interests, but for them. If you want to get thanks for doing something, you're not going to get it from 
helping an alcoholic get up off the ground. The people that are walking around, they're just going to look at you like, why are you, why are you bothering with that? Maybe you know that person, related to that person. There's something going on there. No, you just help them. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. Build that person up. Lift that person's spirit. We talked about it in Sunday school not too long ago. You take someone who's begging somewhere and struggling, and we have that in our community, and you stop and you pray with them, the dignity that comes from that, saying, I care about you enough that I'm going to not just walk past, but I'm going to pray with you. That, that's a powerful thing. Romans 15.3, moving, moving a little farther on. I love this picture in the background. Jesus took the time to sit down with someone who was obviously poor, obviously had some issues. Jesus sat down with him. Romans 15.3 says, for, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it was written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. He lifted the burden. He picked things up for people. That's the example that we've been given. He laid that out for us. So when Jesus did these things, he didn't do them for himself. Now the world, on the other hand, would tell us what? Do what's going to get you something. What's in it for me? What am I going to gain from this? And there will even be people who are religious telling you, you're going to gain from something. You do something, you're going to gain from something. You're earning points. Jesus wasn't earning points. He didn't need to earn any points. Our salvation is secure if we've accepted Christ into our lives, made him a part of our lives. If we've been filled with the Spirit, our salvation is secure. We're not making points. We're not trying to earn something out of this. We're just doing it because that's the right thing to do. It's what Christ asked us to do. John 15, 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. That's the reward. The reward is just remaining. Abide in me and I will abide in you. That's the reward. Is that not what we try and do as Christians, is draw ourselves closer and closer to Jesus? We want to get more and more like him. We want to draw into him. We want to get so close to him, walking so closely with him that we never feel separated. Is that not what we want? And it says, if you keep my commands, I will re you will remain in my love. But Jesus stayed in God's love the whole time. There's no doubt about that. He kept his father's commands and he stayed with his father. There's no doubt about that. We don't question that. So the example was laid out by Jesus for us. 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And that poverty that Jesus went through, he was a simple man. He lived a simple life. The King of Kings, the Creator of the universe, the Lord of Lords, the Word became man and not on a throne. Because that would not have touched us as much, would it? Knowing that he walked where he walked, and he did what he did, and he suffered what he suffered, that's what gives each of us individually hope. And he did not do that for himself. He did that for us. He didn't need to do that for himself. He needed to do that for us so that we would see the love of God through him. So when we see these things, you know the grace of Jesus. You know the grace. For our sake, he did these things. So, just like everything else that we receive, if we receive grace, it should be also distributed. If we take it, we should also give it. Because God's grace is endless. We don't have to hoard it. We don't have to hide it. We don't have to put it in a bank to protect it from other people because the more we give away, the more we're going to get. Grace is one of those things that overflows us. And if, it, if you are accepting it and you are living within the Spirit, the grace will fill you so much it's going to run off of you and you can't help it. And then you go around people and that flood will touch their feet too. 
We got all this water out here right now. And the concept of, of, of the flooding is usually negative, but I want to think of it, I want us to think of this, this grace of God as being a flood that is good for everybody. It's the kind of flood that comes over, runs over the top, and like I said, somebody else will end up stepping in it, and they can't help themselves. And when they do, they'll be blessed. In the same way that we're blessed with grace. So moving on to 15.4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. This is circling back now. As Paul's writing this in Romans, it's circling back around. He's going back to our strength and our hope. And he says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, to help us with our endurance, our personal encouragement, and that we have hope. Without the word, it would be hard to have the hope that we have. And everything written down is for this purpose. There's nothing missing in the Bible. Everything is there for this purpose. To strengthen us, to help us endure the life that we live here on earth, to encourage us as we live that life with the hope of eternal life. Hebrews 10, 35-36, do not throw away your confidence, it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Paul talks often in athletic terms, he talks about running the race to get to the goal. Look ahead to where the victory is. That's our hope. And in between, we need to keep moving forward. Don't stagnate, don't sit still, keep moving. And in that movement comes this hope. And the more hope you have, the more strength you have. The football players have been told that this year, <clears throat> we time their 40s. They do a sprint early in the season. We'll do it early. They'll do a 40-yard sprint. We time that for quickness. We're also going to time them in a mile. And I had one of the players come to me last week, and he said, hey, when we run this mile, it's already in his head. He's already thinking about running the mile for time. I remember doing it in high school, and I didn't like it, but it was there was a reason for it. It's worthwhile. He said, can we not run it at the track? Can we just run a mile out of town in a straight line? I said, why do you want to do that? I know why he wants to do it, because I don't like running on track either. He said, if I'm running in a straight line, I know there's an end. If I'm running in a circle, it seems like it never stops. <laughs> Look at the goal. That's the encouragement. Keep that, keep that in mind. We are running towards a goal. We're going somewhere. And as we go somewhere, that hope is on the finish line. Now the scriptures, this is a passage we all know. 2 Timothy 3.16. 3.16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The objection or objective of the gospel, the objective of all scripture is to train us, to encourage us, to teach us, to fix us when we're broken, to correct things when we're wrong. All of that is there. If we get into the word, that's our workout. If we want to get stronger, get better there. Training, teaching, all those things are there. So our training and teaching and all those things together, that is there for a purpose. All these things that we go through is so that we could be thoroughly equipped. We're supposed to be doing something. If you want to be good at what you do, you train for it, don't you? Josh and Ryan both just graduated from college. Why did they bother? Could they have maybe kind of self-taught and fake their way through a job? Probably. Would they be good at it? Probably not, at least not for a long time. By going to school, what they did is they trained up so that when they got out of school and someone says, I'm going to hire you and your feet hit the ground and you can do the job you're meant to do, that makes sense to us in a worldly way. 
It makes sense to us. If you're going to hire somebody, it'd be nice to hire somebody that could do the job when they got there. You might have to hire somebody and train them up a little bit to, to, to do the work, but it'd be a lot easier if you had somebody that could do it when they showed up. The same thing happens to us in our spiritual walk. There are times in a young spiritual life, there are times when we may not have had enough discipleship and it's we stutter. We struggle. We're not sure about praying out loud in a group. We're not sure about giving somebody advice or trying to share verses with someone. We're hesitant. We haven't quite been trained up yet. And while God can take that and do something with it, think about someone who is trained to run into that situation. And I'll tell you right now, I work at this constantly because I'm standing up here right now on a Sunday. I'm working at this constantly. I'm working at training. I'm working at learning more. I'm, I'm working at trying to be better at what I do. But I also know as a Christian, long before I took this job, that I had to do the same thing. And I'm going to ask you, please, please, do not put it all on me standing up here on Sunday to do everything that we each individually should be doing. Just like our faith is not something that's reserved for one of the seven days a week, our works are not reserved for one of seven days a week or for one person. Each of us are individually called to do these good works. We are all called to be that person. Psalm 121, 1, through 1 and 2. I love this verse. And there's a song by Casting Crowns where they sing this. And I just absolutely love that song. The source of our strength. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and earth. The maker of heaven and earth. Our strength comes from the creator of the universe. <coughs> you can watch all the Marvel movies you want. The one that just came out now that everybody's so crazy about, we went to it. It wasn't about the creation, it was about destruction. Imagine if the creator of the universe was on your side. Nothing could beat you. If you tap into that strength, if we use that strength, if we, if we put ourselves in a position where we can pick it up, So, Romans 15, 5, the last verse of this passage we're going to go through today, says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. May the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. This is summing up this little passage that Paul's brought out here. If you accept that God is powerful, if you accept your salvation through the power of Christ, if you accept that he is with you and as a spirit-filled people we, are gain, we gain strength from that, if you accept all those things, then we should have the attitude in the mind of Christ. That's the next step. We can't stop at salvation. We need to be working for God after that. That's not the finish line. The finish line is heaven. And if we miss that, we are stunting ourselves. We are, we are destroying our own testimony. Who brought you to Christ? Who brought you? Think about that. Yes, Christ came into our lives. Yes, the Spirit overwhelmed me. Yes, the conviction that I got, I know I got from God. However, along the way, there were many people who planted seeds in me, who watered that garden, who fertilized it, who did all the things necessary so that the harvest could be reaped in my life. Each of us has someone like that. Maybe many someones like that. So if you think about it that way, we're just passing it along. And we look at those people that led us to salvation, those people that did so much for us to bring us in, and we're in awe of their strength. 
of the effect they had on us. And Jesus says, well, now go out and do that. Pass it along. Move along, do more of that. How do we live in this unity where we're supposed to be together, this strength and unity that we're supposed to gather we're supposed to gather from God and through our endurance and our perseverance live in unity. Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Remember where we came from. Yeah. Otherwise, we're the Pharisees. If we don't remember where we came from and the fact that we are all sinners saved by grace and no one is greater and no one is lesser than anyone else. If we can't remember that, we're missing the point. Paul says, be willing to associate with those people of low position. Go to their level. When you're in teaching school, one of the things they'll tell you, classroom management classes, all those things, if I'm dealing with Gabby, my best way of dealing with Gabby is to drop down to a knee so I'm eye to eye with her. We'll have a much better relationship. The same thing would happen if I was working in a nursing home. And I had someone in a wheelchair. I saw that in my at the nursing home where my grandmother was. Uh, the staff there was just absolutely awesome. And I'll tell you right now, almost every one of them was an immigrant or someone. Accents were strong, and they were from all over the place. There was at least one from Kenya, I think, we talked to her. But they were from all over the place. Every one of them, when they came into the room, they would bend down and make sure they got at her level when they asked her a question. And I never saw one of them leave the room without giving her a hug on the way out. That, that touched my heart. And my grandmother was getting the kind of care of the people who really cared enough to show that they loved her and to show that they cared about her. They all knew her name. They would come in and check for no reason whatsoever. If somebody pushed the button and she needed to get more pain medication, whatever, somebody was there. And not only did they come and do that, but they also gave her a hug. That was God's hand there. They were being God's hand. We need to be at the level of the people that need to hear from us, whatever that takes. We need to get there so we're eye to eye with the people that need Jesus. Because isn't that what he did? Didn't he get down to where he could be on our level and look us in the face when he spoke to us? Jesus never preached at anyone. He preached to people. And two people is this direction. That is this direction. Two is this direction. It was an eye-to-eye -eye thing. That's where our unity comes from. First Peter 3, 8 says, Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. If we are that way within our own church, we will see growth in this church like you wouldn't believe. We will see strength. We will see individuals growing. We will see people coming and saying, I want what you have. All those things are going to happen if this is who we are. We have an example of that in Acts. Acts 4.32 says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. In the New Testament church, we know that's in, the, in Acts, that's what was going on. They were sharing all their material possessions, but it's not just material possessions we need to be sharing. Everything that we have, whether it's our knowledge, whether it's the grace that we've received, whether it is the peace that we have in our heart should be shared with other people. And that's what brings unity. If you're hurting, I want to know. Share your pain. That's important. If we're really truly going to be a church, if we're truly going to be unified, if we're truly arming ourselves and working our way to where we are doing what God wants us to do, Share your pain. One of the things that always used to make me sad about our church in Blunt, when we did prayer requests, just like we do it up here, there was always one or two people that would just say, unspoken. In other words, they had something they wanted us to pray for, but they didn't want to share what it was. And that hurt. When I heard that, I'm like, oh, do you not trust us enough to share what that is? Wouldn't it be better for us to be specific in our prayer than just say unspoken? Now, I'm not saying somebody can't do that. That's fine if someone feels that way, but there is 
a loss of unity once we get to that point. If there's an inability for us to be honest and be open and to be vulnerable with each other, then there is a struggle for us with unity there. Because we should be basing our, our relationships on love and on trust. So that should all come together. So, what do we do about this now? I just put a couple of things up here. First of all, we need to be working out. We need to be adding to our strength, to knowledge of the Word, to getting in the Word, in prayer, listening to the Spirit, listening to what God's telling you. If you get into the Word and you stop and listen, you will hear. That's part of the workout. Go to the coach who does the work, right? Secondly, once you get it, then use your strength. Help others to be strong. There's that old Ray Bolt song, Thank You. Thank you for giving to the Lord. It was a dream he had of being in heaven, and he said, I'm standing in heaven, and all these people I knew on earth come up and say, Thank you. Because you did this, I'm here. I'm going to meet Sunday school teachers in heaven and say, Ah, you listen. One would probably be my wife, because she's my Sunday school teacher right now. She doesn't say that very often, but she'll say, I listen when we get to heaven. If you need help, follow the, follow the example of Jesus and of the early church. Jesus didn't have a job, right? He didn't have a checking account or a credit <coughs> card. You need help? Ask. Who paid for Jesus' meals? Women. A lot of the women followed him around and did the work while, they, while he was doing the ministry. But he didn't need to worry about those details because he knew God had that. He would take care of that. And he took care of that through things. Like I talked last week about Peter's mother-in-law. He went in, healed her fever, and she immediately stood up started feeding everybody. If you need help, ask. That's what happened in the church. That's what happened with Jesus. And the last thing is we need to endure. We need to continue this. This is a process. This is not a one-time event. This is a process. We, our endurance, our perseverance leads to our hope. And if someone you know steps away from that endurance and that perseverance, their hope will be struggling. Whether that's someone that's in the church, someone that's, that's saved, or someone that's not, the minute the hope of God falls away, that's where they're going to need you the most. Because they need somebody to lean on. That's where they struggle the hardest. If we see someone who has a tragedy in their lives, this car accident we were talking about today, like I said, Shanity was in our school. I didn't have her as a student in class, but I had her when I was a para. I was helping her all the time, especially with math. Math was not her thing. She has an infectious laugh. She has a gait kind of like Jane, just kind of a little bit crazy when you hear it. And she laughs sometimes at inappropriate times, but it just made you want to be around her. She's fun. And she's suffering right now. What does she need the most? Well, she needs hope. And if someone, if she or someone in her family doesn't have God in their lives, where's the hope going to come from? I hope the doctors figure it out. They call it practicing medicine for a reason. They don't have the answers. They just hope they can kind of guess at it. Hope has to come from God. Amen. And through our endurance and perseverance, we find that hope. And if you find somebody sliding behind, lift them up. Now, I don't know if all of you saw this or not. I shared it on Facebook. I think Michelle shared it first. That's where I saw it. Um, at the regional track meet this last week. It was a big one, last chance to qualify for state sort of thing. There is a young man, and I'm trying to remember, I think he might be from Wapala, who is a long distance runner, and he is phenomenal. He's a senior, he is above and beyond. He's really, really, really good. He'd already qualified for state. 
so running the races for him were, you know, I could beat my PR and beat my chest and talk about how good I am, but he'd already won. He'd already got what he needed. It was a great story because what he did then is there's a seventh grader from another school who's got tons and tons of potential. But he's a seventh grader. He's just getting started in all this process. But he's got tons of potential. This senior from a different school ran beside that kid. And they run the 3,200. Remember how many? Eight laps, two miles. He ran beside that kid the whole time. Sorry, it kind of touches me. He coached him. He clapped him on the back. He was cheering him on. And the kid started to pull behind. And the senior turned around and ran backwards and said, I'm waiting for you to catch up. And he caught up. And when they got to the finish line, this senior, who's now a hero to this kid, stepped back on the finish line. And let him finish two tenths of a second ahead of him. This whole race, two miles of running, God bless him, I don't want to do that myself. He gets to the very end with this kid and gives him just that little bit and helps him across. Now, did he win anything? No, he didn't win a race. <coughs> Could he have? Obviously. He dropped the kid for a while. The kid fell off, and he had to bring him back up. He could have done that. But I'll tell you, for someone who runs, and I have been forced to run in my life, it's not something I enjoy. But it's when I was in the military, we ran in formation. <coughs> you always ran with the person next to you. And I have heard... So many people that run competitively say, I hate to be in the front <coughs> because I don't know how to pace myself. And all the good runners that run competitively will tell you, they will pick that person out and say, I'm going to stay with that guy. And they'll take off and they'll try and find someone that leads. Well, just like this young man did, that's why it touched me so much. I looked at my own life. Am I doing that? Am I cheering somebody on as they run their race? Am I running beside them as they run their race? Do I care if I win? No, I don't care if I win. Because boy, I'd be really proud if I if I brought somebody along with me and they crossed that finish line. That would make me proud. <coughs> I don't know if any of you guys saw the Preakness yesterday. I did a horse race, another racing thing. Something kind of neat happened at Preakness. First of all, the winner was the guy that got boxed out at the Kentucky Derby. The winner of the Kentucky Derby and the guy that got disqualified for boxing this other horse out weren't there, but the one that got boxed out blew him away, apparently. But there was one other special thing there. There was a horse who, at the gate, is, had, they had some problems in the gate. There was a handler there. He pulled against the handler. He bucked. The jockey didn't have his feet in the stirrups. He lost the rider. And the horse finished the race without him. Took off and ran out there by himself. Now, he didn't win the race because he was by himself. He didn't have the judgment of a jockey. He didn't have all that kind of stuff with someone guiding him. But he tried to run the race himself. A horse with an empty saddle took off and followed the pack and challenged. He pushed up ahead of other horses. He was pushing, <clears throat> doing the best he could. Now, he couldn't have won without a jockey. There's no way. There's a reason somebody has to ride the horses. He was trying to run the race by himself, and it wasn't going to work for him, but his heart was trying. And I see that, and I think, boy, as hard as that horse tried, what if he'd had somebody guiding him? What if he had somebody walking, riding a bit, a little pressure on the rein, speed up here, slow down here, take your time, cut back in here, all those kind of things. Maybe that one would have run, won the race. He stole the race. Everybody said that's all that people were watching was, here goes the riderless horse coming up. There are people in this world that are riderless right now but still want to run the race. If we recognize them, we can bring them along. And they can cross their finish line because we're bringing them along. 
These are the things that God asks us to do. These are following the, the, the commands of Christ. This is what we are missing.